Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, professor of history at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. From 10 to 12 May 2022, the U.S. Army War College hosted the first annual Strategic Land Power Symposium. According to its official report, the symposium aimed to advance the concepts surrounding the role of strategic land power in cooperation, competition, integrated deterrence, and joint all-domain operations. Bringing together students, scholars, and practitioners, the symposium displayed original research and presented solutions to senior leaders about how land power can help achieve national strategic objectives in the future. As part of the symposium, Army leadership had asked the U.S. Army War College Strategic Land Power Integrated Research Project faculty to address the question, what is the future role of strategic land power in cooperation, competition, integrated deterrence, and joint all-domain operations? Taking up that challenge, seven members of the U.S. Army War College Class of 2022 participated in the IRP, Uh, integrated research project as part of their Master of Strategic Studies degree research requirement and presented their results to the symposium. To amplify their work and to show the kind of research that we do here at the War College, A Better Peace has organized two podcast sessions with those students to discuss their projects, their relationship to the Strategic Land Power Symposium, and possible implications for the future of United States security policy. This is the second of two sessions. And today's topic is Setting the Theater with Lieutenant Colonel Tim Sikorsky, Colonel Curtis Perkins, and Lieutenant Colonel Tim Clark. Lieutenant Colonel Tim Sikorsky is an Army Information Operations Officer with tactical through operational experience. He recently served in Germany as a planner and chief of operations and programs in the U.S. Africa Command Information Operations Division and as the Special Operations Command Europe Chief of Information Operations. Lieutenant Colonel Sikorsky will assume the role of five core G-39 Information Operations Chief following graduation from the U.S. Army War College. Colonel Curtis S. Perkins previously served as the Quartermaster Branch Proponent Chief. He has served in leadership positions at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels and has served on numerous deployments to Afghanistan, Iraq, and Kuwait. His next assignment is the 13th Expeditionary Sustainment Command Chief of Staff. And Lieutenant Colonel Tim Clark, his most recent assignments include Command Transportation Officer at Fort Buchanan, Puerto Rico, and Professor of Military Science at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. After starting his career in the active component, he became a drilling reservist while serving seven years as a civilian supervisor with the Army Corps of Engineers. He deployed to Kuwait and Afghanistan and is currently an active guard and reserve officer and will be the next inspector general for the Army Reserve Aviation Command at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Welcome to A Better Peace, gentlemen. Thank you, Ron. You bet. It's great to have you all here. To to get started, I want to give each of you a chance to summarize your research that you presented to the symposium and that you were working on as part of the uh, IRP. And we're going to go in reverse alphabetical order. So I'm going to start with Tim Sikorsky. Go ahead, Tim. Hey, thanks, Dr. Canary. Uh, so what I was looking at when I joined this project was how the theater army conducts operations in the information environment, specifically what's the theater army's role in the information environment. Uh, I haven't done a lot of joint tours and seen how uh, uh, information operations done from a, a joint perspective. Uh, I saw there's a not a lot of understanding of, of how the theater army contributes uh, to uh, information operations. So that that's kind of what I wanted to look at. And uh, to do my research, first, I looked at our threat uh, that we're operating in and uh, specifically looking at Russia and China. Uh, and what they're doing is they're primarily competing in the uh, in the information space because uh, they're trying to achieve their objectives without uh, 
without rising to our level of, of armed uh, conflict. So that's that's primarily focused on influence. They're looking to achieve similar objectives, uh, albeit uh, we see both Russia and China uh, leveraging different methods. Uh, you know, particularly now with what's going on in Ukraine, we see Russia be more aggressive than uh, than China, which has taken more of a of a long term focus. Uh, so both of them are focused on increasing their regional influence at uh, at un- at the expense of the United States and other Western uh, powers and our allies. Uh, they're looking at undermining our uh, democratic system to show that uh, their own authoritarian systems are are more efficient and more effective. And uh, they're also looking at how they could fracture uh, our alliances. Uh, you know, Russia is specifically focused on NATO and in China uh, on the uh, alliance systems that we have with our with our allies in, in the Pacific uh, and our partners there as well. So. From there, I looked at the uh, the role of the joint force of the military in general in the information environment uh, and how the military instrument of power is supporting the rest of the government, the diplomatic and the, the economic means. Uh, we don't really have a uh, cabinet level department that is focused on information and coordinating all the other instruments of national power to to have effects in the information environment. So it, it, it's kind of an ad hoc game. Uh, but the joint force is uniquely resourced and postured to to support, uh, uh, particularly our, our diplomatic efforts in the information environment uh, by providing some of that that backbone and and capabilities to demonstrate resolve. And then within the uh, joint force, we have the theater army uh, will support operations in the information environment uh, and the theater armies because they live on land uh, where you know our. Our allies, our partners, people we're trying to influence live. They can support the joint force by helping us understand both the cognitive and the technical environment. So what people think, how they respond, how they behave, uh, and then also how information uh, flows uh, within the environment, whether that's through cyberspace, electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, Our presence and posture uh, via exercises, uh, reinforcing our alliance structure, demonstrating our capabilities, uh, influences are both adversary and allied and partner behavior, and then also looking at how we could prepare the environment. So design our actions specifically to influence our adversary in competition prior to armed conflict. So conditioning adversary per, uh, perceptions, uh, looking at, you know, going a bit further from understanding the environment to prepping the environment in a, in a technical realm. Uh, whether that's through the electromagnetic spectrum or through cyber. Uh, so it, if anything elevates up to a crisis or a conflict, we are, we are prepared to respond and doing that in conjunction with our allies and partners. Uh, and then for the recommendations, looking at uh, having a higher priority in manning the theater army staff, uh, they're habitually undermanned. Uh, so having, having that higher priority and fully manning the staff is going to enable particularly that understanding of the environment and some of the planning uh, expertise that they're needed uh, to support those roles in the theater army. And then also different formations uh, that, that'll operate within the environment and competition. Look, especially looking at the information, intelligence, cyber electronic warfare and space battalions that are within the multi-domain task forces uh, to support targeting and sensing for multi-main operations, long-range fires, and how we uh, support the uh, decision dominance with our new information advantage doctrine. And then also we have our theater information advantage elements uh, that could really help support that theater army staff with additional expertise, uh, looking at uh, targeting in particular, um, and then developing that situational understanding and then assessing our effects in the information environment, which is often overlooked. Thank you, Tim, for getting us started. Appreciate that. Now I'm going to go to Curtis Perkins. Thank you, uh, Dr. Granary. Again, this uh, just as a recap, the title of my my project is uh, Theater Army Sustainment Modernization for Multi-Domain Operations. My thesis, the Army must examine and align the modernization of theater Army sustainment capabilities to set the theater for the multi-domain operations environment and avoid repeating historical logistics challenges. As background information, adversaries have developed more capable militaries 
that can degrade theater sustainment capabilities. The current Big Six Army modernization priorities are a transformative approach to mitigating the impact of those adversary capabilities, but must be aligned with the theater army's sustainment capabilities as well. Historically, the theater army experienced timeless challenges in theater sustainment related to modernization of transportation platforms, supply management, and reception staging and onward integration of forces, also known as RSOI. Challenges in Operation Desert Shield provide examples of these timeless challenges in theater sustainment operations. Therefore, the theater army sustainment modernization is critical to the army modernization strategy. Recommendations included facility improvements to protect and disperse theater sustainment capabilities to improve survivability. Furthermore, the Army must leverage experiments through the Army's project convergence to produce data-driven analysis and lessons learned to help generate sustainment requirements for the multi-domain operations environment. And finally, the modernization of theater army sustainment capabilities requires additional resources and time to adjust global sustainment posture. Ultimately, the army cannot rely on ad hoc sustainment solutions to support future multi-domain operations. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. That was, thank you, Colonel. That was great. Uh, and now, uh, last but not least, could I please hear from Tim Clark? Good afternoon. Thank you. The title of my project was Rethinking Logistics for Pacific Multi-Domain Operations. And my thesis is that the Army, even as a part of a joint force, is unprepared for Pacific combat operations. The dynamic nature of multi-domain operations, the theater's vast expanse, and contested environment expose age logistics concepts and platforms as insufficient to meet the future's demands. Fortunately, emerging technologies such as additive manufacturing, which is sometimes called 3D printing, and the Internet of Things will enable novel conversations about domestic manufacturing, logistics, and the military. They offer new ways for diplomatic and economic competition while enabling shorter, flexible, and redundant lines of communication during conflict. Some of my main points include exploring how there's been a long habit of trading tail for teeth, because originally strategic weapons would afford long mobilizations. But over decades, this policy resulted in a force that is out of balance for the rigors of near-peer combat across long and contested lines of communication. For example, the U.S. lost recent Pacific War Games due to a shortage of lift and distribution. Years of silence to our military and civilian leaders on policy created a situation where today all of the Department of Defense and the Merchant Marines cannot match the 400 ships of one World War II service squadron. Nor can our shipbuilding and general manufacturing keep pace with the known demand. Pacific MDO's requirements, such as inserting enablers, projecting forces, and their dispersion, creates a previously unseen level of demand on logistics. These in a contested environment prevent stationary stockpiles and exacerbate the platform shortage. In looking for solutions, I found the insights of Rear Admiral Henry Eccles, a World War II Pacific Theater commander. He helped me see the larger civilian military enterprise as a true driver of national military power. Rather than the tunnel vision, we logistics officers often get on just military owned and internal capabilities. He establishes that this logistics enterprise is the bridge between the nation and its tactical forces. Applying a strategy requires very specific tactics, which themselves demand a certain logistics capability is readily available. Thus, he establishes that the military civilian logistics enterprise limits policy options. He endorses us all to take a commander's view promoting logistics as a co-equal partner to strategy and tactics. By extension, this demands a full system view of national security, setting logistics capability in the military or the civilian economy in advance of a conflict. He believes this is determinant to the strategies that the nation can pursue in a crisis. Eccles also decries what he calls a logistics snowball, which is if logistics are imbalanced, it reduces the flexibility and responsiveness, which forces commanders to order earlier and often more than what they actually need. This will then justify even larger logistics activities whose overhead, again, reduce the system capacity and responsiveness for the warfighter. This is essentially at the crux of today's argument called demand reduction that is reemerging inside the Department of Defense. One of the areas I see in the civilian economy that can help 
us solve this problem is called additive manufacturing. It can make parts almost anywhere with less waste and often cheaper. These parts currently made separately can be printed as finished assemblies. Integrating additive manufacturing into current platform sustainment and to inform future designs will derive a positive spiral of demand reduction for fuel, transit space, and even augment with additional supply lines. The Navy has already flown planes with flight critical parts that they printed in-house. Logistics has often been the soft underbelly of our nation's resolve. Most conflicts over the past 50 years fell short of at least some of its strategic goals, partly due to vulnerability along lines of communication. Yet the Army redesigned its combat forces, making them even more exquisite and complex to sustain without really overhauling its logistics capabilities. There are intangible costs from this reactive logistics, whether it be deaths, attacks that result in PTSD and their effect on public opinion, and it is also excessively expensive with direct costs to reactively modernize during combat, thinking about up armor kits and the recent purchase of numerous MRAPs. These costs affect what policy options uh, our leaders will consider acceptable. There may be desirable actions that inadequacies in the military and civilian economy would for forestall us taking during a crisis. Some of my recommendations to move forward in modernizing logistics would be first to just ask open-ended questions, thinking how could I sustain certain operations, untethered to the current thought and in light of the new OE's demands and these emerging technologies. We can also embrace the politically aware officer model of Janowitz to inform leaders of the state of the economy's impact on the military. For example, lobbying for maritime policy changes in items such as the Jones Act to rebuild domestic industry and allow cooperating with partners. Internally, the Army can begin assigning trial units, first at the theater support command level and begin working their way down maybe eventually to the brigade combat team level to operationalize additive manufacturing. Partnering with industry for novel solutions for demand reduction, i.e. additive manufacturing design unmanned systems for delivery. Doing this will yield second and third order effects to reduce logistics troops and enable multiple mobile hubs and lines of communication. To set the theater, looking at additive manufacturing infrastructure needed at select forward activities. This can enable the shorter, flexible, and survivable lines of communication across the theater. And we should prioritize the Indo-PACCOM region for these investments. And during strategic competition, additive manufacturing is a critical vulnerability to China's growth. Partner agencies and NGOs should be encouraged to apply diplomatic and economic levers to decrease Chinese influence across the region. These efforts have the dual purpose of also setting the theater for additive manufacturing capability ahead of conflict. Henry Eccles stated that the sole purpose of logistics is to sustain forward combat power in pursuit of national strategies. Ending the reactive logistics as an afterthought approach and applying new technologies to re-envision logistics for modernization is the best way to align the required force capabilities to demands of the national strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. So the three of you, when I listen to these, these, uh, each of these presentations, right, you're talking about uh, preparing the battle space, right, setting the theater, uh, getting the, the uh, skills and the, and the equipment ready uh, to be able to be delivered. Um, one of the terms that you've, that you've used a lot, which is familiar to the people at the symposium, but might not be as familiar to a lot of our audience, is the concept of the theater army. And I am curious, as a, uh, as a non, uh, somebody who's not a complete specialist in these questions, because th when you talk about multi-domain operations and you're talking about strategic land power, but also you're talking about it in the context of something like, say, Indo-PACOM, where there's uh, a lot less land than there is water, um, what is the concept or how does the concept of the theater army fit in with this, uh, this idea of being prepared for multi-domain operations? I'm going to throw that out since all three of you use the term at one time or another. I'm going to throw that open to all three of you if anybody wants to jump in first. Well, and looking at the theater army, Dr. Ganeri, look at, I would say amongst the joint force, you have the theater army or the, the army service component command is, is what, what kind of controls the, the army units that, that are operating within a theater, whereas Indo-Pacific or uh, European command. And, and really that, that's kind of where I focused and, and more along a steady state. So with, uh, and, and having come from Europe in particular, I always had, um, 
uh, U.S. Army Europe and, and Africa kind of in, in, in the back of my mind thinking, uh, and that's much more land centric fight. Um, thinking about how Usurer could could really focus on employing its capabilities in theater to really understand and set the conditions for effective operations uh, in the information environment. Mm-hmm. And and I would say the same thing for for Indo Paycom as well. Uh, while there's there's a lot of water in Indo Paycom, people still live on land. Sure. Uh, so uh, and that would be an area where I think. Uh, U.S. Army Pacific could really focus on showing its value to the joint force as far as how it influences or contributes to influencing people, influencing adversaries, partners, and allies by demonstrating uh, capabilities, which um, uh, Curtis and Tim also talked about uh, with our ability to deploy and sustain ourselves. And and that will have a a deterrent effect uh, potentially on our, on our adversaries. Right. Well, and, and Curtis, I want to go directly to you on this too, because uh, Tim said the magic word there of sustainment and uh, the, the idea that any conflict that breaks out can heavily be sort of come as you are. Um, you fight with what you have on hand is how does one, how does one prepare in advance for sustainment across the theater? Wow. In, in indo pecan specifically, mm-hmm. the, the water may be perceived as a, as a constraint to the army. There's also some opportunities for sustainment as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that the the key is is thinking differently. Okay, and so as I was uh, offering in my work, uh, we have a lot of traditional framework that we've operated off of for several decades uh, to conduct sustainment to support ourselves in any theater of operations. And so now with this multi-domains operations concept, we have to uh, disperse a mm-hmm. lot of our capabilities. So what is that? imply that implies uh, really looking at opportunities to to partner with other uh, nations in the area to potentially disperse our forces and find new and innovative ways to uh, uh, support our forces that will enter that theater of operations mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and Tim this good this uh, Tim Clark this goes to you then as well you talk about being prepared for logistics in advance I mean uh, as as I think the uh, a, if we had any, well, if there are any living Russian army commanders around to talk to us right now, they would talk about how you sometimes don't know how bad your logistics are until you actually try to use them in a conflict. But how can or should the army think proactively about the role of logistics in the in a theater as vast as indo Excellent question. And you know, the original discussion here was talking about the theater army. And, and one, I think it's critical to view them um, as needing to be looking forward and advising the army on mm-hmm. these capabilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know they're kind of, they've never really went away, but they're kind of making a comeback in doctrine to be a little bit more centrally important as we've over the past 20 years drifted towards the brigade combat team as a central unit of action. And we've realized that to go against a, a near peer competitor, we're going to have to go to mass uh, forces a little better. And the sustainment volume is just going to be that much more increased. And so that's, the essential part of the theater army is to be thinking about these in advance. And we know it's a, uh, it's a minimum of five years to get money to invest in anything through our acquisitions process. So they need to be thinking out that far and starting things in, in advance to set us up for success. And that's, that's one of the areas where I'm excited about my paper specifically talks about the future of additive manufacturing, uh, maybe being able to set the theater in these areas. And it's not immediately over going uh, overnight going to replace traditional manufacturing, but it, it gives us ways to augment supply lines where maybe I can produce a part in the Philippines and get it somewhere in three days instead of having to wait for the next run in, the, in America and sail it across the ocean um, and get it to some location, you know, on the limited land mass in the Pacific. And so I, I believe that's the importance that the theater army brings to this is it understands its region. It can understand what capabilities and shortages it has, and it can start advising um, and looking forward to how to bring in and set that theater in advance for logistics. And logistics is not a fast thing. It, it, it took us 50 or 60 years to divest most of our uh, water and transportation assets to the limited situation that we're in now. Mm-hmm. And it's going to take a good amount of time also to build that back up. But if we don't start soon, um, as Henry Eccles warned us, we're going to find ourselves unable to pursue certain desired policy options that we would otherwise like to, but it's just 
not possible to re- respond cost effectively or in a timely manner. Right. Well, and and this gets to a question now, once again, for, for the three of you, we talk about the theater army, we talk about the land component, right? Tim Sikorsky, you mentioned that we, we find on land is important because that's where the people are. Um, and uh, in the name of jointness, I will have to say that the United States Army, as wonderful as it is, um, is not the only land based component um, in uh, the joint force. And what's the relationship between the theater army and the Marine Corps um, in a place like, uh, in a place like Indopaycom? I think of that as a particularly Marine, uh, Marine heavy organization. Tim Clark, you look like you want to say something in response to that. <laughs> I won't put anybody Thanks. directly on the spot. On there. I didn't want to jump in on, a, <laughs> on Tim's turf, but I had read across the some of this discussion about just the simple volume of mass it's going to require mm-hmm. to operate in the Pacific. Um, and looking back again to World War II, we can learn a lot always from history and pulling it forward. Uh, the United States Army did have to do a lot of landings and provide the mass to the Marine Corps concepts. Mm-hmm. And I think the Marine Corps is excellent in their research. They're getting ahead of uh, the specific problem with their expeditionary advanced base operations. They're doing great work. But just at the end of the day, when you're looking at needing hundreds of thousands, if not million soldiers uh, across the whole joint force, uh, you're also going to have to partner up very closely uh, with with the Army That's in fair. the future to execute that concept. That's good. Tim Sikorsky, since I did throw the question to you first, do you want to jump in on that too? Well, yeah, you know, and, and when it comes to joint war fighting, you know, that that's why we kind of operate in a, a GIFLIC or a CGIFLIC, the Joint Forces Land Component Command, mm, right. um, where we would operate jointly with, with our our Marine Corps brothers and sisters on, on land. Uh, and, and, and as we discussed in, in seminar and, and some also, uh, with our, uh, with, within the IRP. And, and I think you'll hear from, uh, from one, one of our classmates, uh, talking about expeditionary advanced based operations, uh, in, in, in the other, uh, episode, um, there's some risk that that's involved with the, the Marine Corps concepts right now. So they're, they're getting lighter, they're getting uh, more mobile, but it, some of that is coming at the cost of, of logistics and, and some of the heavier firepower, like we heard the Marines uh, have, have recently divested of, of their armor assets too. So there definitely has to be uh, some joint synergy on land when it comes to how we, how we sustain that and how we provide uh, mutually supported uh, firepower, uh, both, uh, both armor uh, artillery and and a lot of this also goes towards how how we look at it from an information standpoint as well mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. you're looking at influence uh, marines have their own brand that works very well uh it's recognized uh throughout the world when when, when they come ashore people know uh and and that in and of itself is is a message that that supports both the army marines and the joint force as a whole uh, when we're when we're trying to either influence an adversary or or a population uh, for our our own objectives, and, and, and I, I think that's that's pretty important. And with that mobility that they provide, that helps do things like create ambiguity for our adversary. That influences how we would leverage things like deception. If you look at the Gulf War and the role that the Marines played uh, for for deception operations, right? Right. Well, and this, uh, and 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 I want to bring Curtis in here on this too. A, a question that I could ask either at the beginning or the end of this conversation, and we're sort of on our way to the end, so I'm going to ask it: of uh, what led you to become interested in? pursuing your research requirement at the War College within this particular integrated research project on strategic land power? Um, and uh, what is it that the, the study of strategic land power uh, is doing for you? And what are you doing you th- uh, in, your, in your mind to advance the concept of strategic land power with your research? Curtis, I want to ask you first. Um, I think I've always been a student of uh, strategic land power. Uh, indirectly. Throughout my career, I've been involved in several organizations and units at the operational and strategic level that uh, supported geographic command, combatant command operations, also at the strategic level where we would coordinate for industrial-based assets to, to support uh, operational, uh, the operational environment. And so when I got to the, to the uh, Army War College, 
uh, it was it kind of was right in my alley, right? It was an opportunity to continue to sharpen my sword, continue to look at uh, problems. Now that we're going moving into multi-domain operations, it gave me an opportunity to to rehash some of what I understood about uh, how army sustainment runs for the theater army and then take a, a new approach to it and see where we need to go for the new multi-domain operations concept. And so that piqued my interest and I signed up for the course and it was a, a great experience, great learning experience. And I appreciate the opportunity. Outstanding. Great. Tim or Tim, uh, what led you, what led you to the IRP? Well, I'll take a stab Tim here. Clark, uh, go. Without, uh, copying too much of what Curtis said, I think he, he nailed a lot of it from a logistician's point of view. I knew I needed to get back closer to uh, the actual tactic war fighting. Uh, and so when I saw that this is going to look at the new emerging concept of multi-domain operations, which uh, in, until this study was a buzzword, but not really understood, I couldn't put my arms around it, I wouldn't have been able to explain it to anyone. So that drew me in first. And then also knowing that if we're looking at near peer adversaries, uh, as important as the brigade combat team, uh, being the central unit of action as, as successful as that was for its time, then divisions and theater armies, I was going to need to understand what their role was more than what my, uh, we'll call it a skewed operational experience was over the last 20 years, uh, to understand what their more traditional and doctrinal role was. So that drew, drew me into the IRP. Uh, and then, of course, just being able to then ponder the problems with that, because that's what logisticians do. We solve problems, and I'm also an engineer by school. So both of those things in my brain said, okay, I can see a lot of holes in this, and let me explore those a little bit and propose some solutions that can make this a little better in the future for the Army. And so those were the things that kind of attracted me in, and I enjoyed learning a lot from the instructors, from my peers, and uh, just all of us tossing ideas and issues around. I really feel like helped sharpen everybody's understanding of theater Army, multi-domain operations, you know, in the future of warfare. Right. Makes a lot of sense. And Tim Sikorsky, of course, since your next assignment is going to take you to a place where let's just say large land units, although not American land units are currently in operation. Um, how has your study of it within the IRP and strategic land power helped to shape not only your academic experience at the war college, but your, your sense of yourself within the army? I would say being a, an army information operations professional, uh, yeah, I've grown up seeing that information operations and operations in the information environment, what whatever we're calling it today, is is inherently a joint endeavor. And and maybe that I'm just skewed towards that view with my time at, at Africa Command and, and Sakir. Uh but but I, I truly believe that deep down, but having that joint perspective also highlighted that the army invested heavily early into uh, information, you know, we have, you know, the largest and most active continually serving PSYOP regiment. Uh, we've had the information operations, uh, career field for going on over two decades now, plus cyber, plus, you know, other public affairs and, and, and other information related capabilities. And we're starting to see the other joint services or the other, our sister services, uh, catch up. Um, and, and this was something I, I, I found kind of fascinating when I was at Sakir was seeing the air force, how they're developing their operations, in the information environment, and they're actually finding unique and creative and effective ways to leverage air power in, in the information environment to influence our adversaries. The Marines are doing the same things with the investments they're making. So seeing that and then seeing how they're invested in their theater elements, and how the army, even though we've been investing and building information professionals for a long time, we were under investing in our theater armies and and the information environment, and even in some regards under investing in the joint force as well. Um, you know, we kind of get pushed more towards the tactical level organizations. I, I think we kind of need to up our game towards that um, towards that more theater strategic level. Uh, and, and how do we set the theater in the information environment? Because if, if you're not looking at the information environment long before a crisis, you've already lost. So so that that's that's what got, got me interested in looking at information from a theater perspective. And then when I saw the uh, Strategic Land Power IRP advertised, you know, we had our 
electives uh, fair uh, that that we went through, where you got to see all the areas of concentration and talking with uh, uh, Professor Cantwell and uh, and uh, Professor Cunningham at, with those uh, that that are in charge of of the of the IRP and seeing the schedule that they had built out and the level of guest speakers that were coming. And we had former theater army commanders. We had uh, army futures command came and talked quite a bit. Uh, and then even some of the professors from the war college, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Dvorak uh, given us our, our class on uh, theater army logistics uh, as a non-logistics guy. I, I found that fascinating because uh, normally I'd, don't find logistics fascinating. So the, um, it's a good thing. We, we, but, we recorded this remotely. So you're not in the same room with Curtis yeah. and uh, with Tim to say something like that. But that gave me a whole, whole bigger appreciation of what it takes for a theater army. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and that's kind of what I appreciated when my interactions with Tim and Curtis as well is, is how does logistics support information? How does information support logistics? You know, I mean, I could go on for hours about OPSEC, about deception, and about how we demonstrate capabilities, and we can't do any of that without logistics, which, you know, really puts the I in the IRP. Right. Well, and the and the idea of, of the IRP, but also of the Strategic Land Power Symposium was to encourage uh, both the participants and the audience, uh, and both the, the immediate audience, but also, you know, Big Army, as Big Army sees what the symposium did, to think about how these things all fit together. Um, it was a, uh, I, the, the symposium itself was a series of fascinating conversations, and this has been a very fascinating conversation. I'm afraid we're about out of time for today, but I really thank Lieutenant Colonel Tim Sikorsky, Colonel Curtis Perkins, and Lieutenant Colonel Tim Clark for joining us here on A Better Peace to talk about their work in the Integrated Research Project on strategic land power. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Great talk. And thanks to all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and on all the programs and suggestions for future programs. We're always interested in hearing from you. Please take a moment to subscribe to A Better Piece on your podcatcher of choice, because if you've listened this long and you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Um, please subscribe. And after you have subscribed to A Better Piece, please rate and review this podcast because that's how more people can find out about us. And that broadens the audience for conversations like this one. And even though this conversation is over, we look forward to welcoming you to the next one. And so until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.